This question will walk through the accounting for a defined benefit pension plan. Squeaky Corporation is a private company with a defined benefit pension plan. The following information is available for Squeaky Corporation for 2020. We're given the opening balance of the deferred benefit obligation, the opening balance of the plan assets, service cost, employer contributions, which are paid evenly through 2020, applicable interest rate, actual return on plan assets, and an actuarial loss due to a change in assumptions. And it asks, assuming that Squeaky follows IFRS, determine the 2020 effect of the pension plan on pension expense and the company's shareholders' equity. Okay, so what I propose is the best way to manage the information that we're given in the question and make sure we have the right numbers for the pension expense and the company's impact on shareholders' equity that we prepare a pension worksheet. So let's take a look at that. So I've set one up here already in Excel. So this is just my basic pension worksheet that I've created. You can see here I've got debits are not in brackets and credits will be in brackets. It's important to be able to distinguish between the debits and the credits as you're putting items into your worksheet. And then I've got a, the first column here is for items, which I'm going to list out the different transactions. And then these accounts here in blue are the accounts that are part of the company's general ledger. So these are actually corporate records or part of our GL. And we've got OCI, pension expense, cash, and the net defined benefit, asset and liability. And then over here, we've got two memo accounts. So these are part of the pension plan itself, which is a separate legal entity. So over here, we've got the defined benefit obligation and the plan assets. So let's go back to the question and let's get started filling out our worksheet. So what are we told first of all? So we're told we're given the opening balance for the deferred benefit obligation of 210 and the opening balance for plan assets of 200. So let's start by putting those opening balances into our pension worksheet. So let's go January 1st, 2020 opening balances. It's also good to be as specific as possible with periods because you can have a question where there are multiple periods. So you wanna make sure that you've got everything clear. And so we're told that the opening balance of the deferred benefit obligation is 210,000. Now this is a credit, it's a liability. So the opening balance of the liability is 210,000. The opening balance of the plan assets were 200,000 and that's an uh, asset. So the opening balance is of course gonna be a debit. And now we're not given in the question the opening balance for the net deferred benefit or the net deferred asset or liability. But we do know that this, so if we look at this, is this plan funded or, un, or underfunded? So have a surplus or a deficit? Well, we've got plan assets of 200,000, but we have a liability of 210,000. So it's actually underfunded by 10,000. And that's the amount that the company has to recognize on their statement of financial position is that they have a liability to fund this plan for the net difference between the deferred benefit obligation and the plan assets. These are not in the company's records, so they don't see these. What they're gonna see in their financial statements is that, they, that the plan is short of funds by $10,000. And because deferred defined benefit plans are the company's responsibility, the employer's responsibility, the employer's on the hook to make sure that what they've promised the employees in terms of this future payment will take place, they have to record it, any shortage on their balance sheet, and they can also record a surplus. Um, okay, so we've got that one. So we've picked up these two accounts. We've picked up this, these two information. Now we're given a service cost of 58,000. So how are we gonna record that? So this is a current period service cost. So this is the 2020 service cost. So as the employees are working, this is the addition to the liabilities that they're earning as a result of their service. And this amount was 58,000. So this is going to be a debit to pension expense. So because we're increasing an expense at the debit and a credit to the deferred benefit obligation. So there's a higher obligation now because the employees, sorry, wrong line, because the employees have been working, they've earned another $58,000 of, uh, of deferred defined benefit, um, 
defined benefit promises, I should say. And so we've got debit expense and credit the defer defined benefit obligation. Now it's important to note, of course, this is not in the company's records, but this is where this account goes. Okay, so we got that one. What else? Next, we're given the employer contributions. This is really important, paid evenly throughout 2020. That is going to be really important later, and we'll get to that. But for right now, there's employer contributions during the year of 77,000. So let's record those, employer contributions. So what, what's the journal entry for employer contributions? Well, employer contributions, if you think about the company, they're paying out, they're paying $77,000 into the plan. So they're going to credit cash, sorry, 77,000. credit cash and the plan assets are gonna increase because they just put money into the plan. So now the plan assets are gonna increase by 77,000. Okay, so we've got that, what's next? Then we've got, next we're given the applicable interest or discount rate. And this is probably the most complex area of accounting for defined benefit plans is figuring out the expected return on plan assets and the defined benefit obligation. So how it works is that the company or there is going to be an interest component on the plan assets. So the plan assets are cash sitting in an account or they might be investments, but there's some sort of um, an, an instrument that's earning interest. So we expect that instrument to earn interest at 10%. So for plan assets, we've got 200,000 times 10%, which is normally what we would do as our expected return on plan assets. However, if we think back to the question, remember how I said this was really important, how it said employer contributions were paid evenly throughout 2020? The reason that that's important is because normally we assume that the employer contributions are paid at the end of the year. But if the question says that they were paid evenly through 2020, or if it said they were all paid at the beginning of the year, that's going to impact the weighted average plan assets. So the, the expected return on plan assets is going to be the weighted average balance of plan assets. So in this case, we're told they're paid evenly throughout the year. So the calculation that we're going to do here is going to be are 200,000 of plan assets plus, plus half plus 77,000 times one over two. Because basically the, the contributions were, we've earned, we, we expect that we would have earned interest on them for half the year. So this is gonna give us 238,000 let me change this. So this is going to give us 238,500 is, is that is the math there. So that number times 10% is going to give us our expected return on plan assets, which is going to be 23,850. I could have just typed those numbers into Excel, but I wanted to illustrate the formula clearly here. So then so this is going to be, let me insert a line here. This is gonna be the expected return on plan assets. So what is this? How do we re recognize this entry? We're going to, it's going to increase pension expense. So actually because we're earning interest, it's gonna decrease our pension expense because this money can be used to pay off the benefits that are promised under the plan. So we're decreasing our pension expense. It's a credit to pension expense and it's a debit to plan assets because our plan assets are now worth more. Okay, now then the other side of this is that we do have an expected, uh, expected interest on the DBO. So the, the DBO is calculated at the present value. So each period that passes this, the value of the benefits that we've promised the employees in the future is worth more because it's coming closer and closer and closer. So we expect to return, we expect to return on the plan assets. This is gonna decrease our pension expense, but we also know that this deferred benefit obligation is increasing at the same time. So we have a similar calculation for that which is gonna be our defined benefit 
our de defined benefit obligation is 210,000 times 10%, which is gonna give us 21,000. And now this entry increases pension expense. So it offsets the prior one. It offsets the return on plan assets. Now we have our liabilities increased by 21,000. And of course, this is gonna increase our liability here. So the debit is to the pension expense and the credit is to the defined benefit obligation in the pension plan as a memo account for the company. So if you look at these things net, the net expected return between the plan assets and the deferred benefit obligation, the net is gonna be 28,000. The net here, I'll pull up this down. The net is gonna be $2,850. So on pension expense. So you can see that the, the return on plan assets decreases our pension expense, but the fact that the deferred benefit obligation is increasing, increases our pension expense. So the net of the two is the impact. It makes sense to calculate them separately, and this is a pretty complex area, but it is important to keep in mind the difference between those two things is, is relatively small. Okay, so we dealt with that now. Now we're told that the actual return on plan assets was 25,000. So we had expected to get 23,850 as our return, but we actually got 25,000. So actual return, Plan assets is going to be 23,850 minus 25,000. Ignoring the signs here. So the difference here is going to be $1,150. Okay. And this is an entry now that we need to record. Now, where are we going to record this? It's important to note in the question, it said that is following IFRS. So because we're following IFRS, we do have this additional column here for other comprehensive income. So our remeasurement of the return on plan assets in under IFRS is recorded under other comprehensive income. Other comprehensive income is a debit balance, is part, sorry, as a credit balance, is part of shareholders equity. So we're going to increase our, this is a positive impact on OCI, which is going to be a credit. And the other side of it is going to be an increase in plan assets because they earn more than we had expected. Okay, so the reason that this is going through OCI is because this is remeasurement of our expected return on plan assets, which is recorded through OCI under IFRS. So we got that one. And we've got one more uh, entry here, an actuarial loss due to a change in actuarial assumptions. So it says that this is a loss any changes to actuarial assumptions are remeasurement changes. So these go for under IFRS, these go through OCI. Actuarial loss. So this is going to be, now this is an, a loss. So this is going to decrease our equity, which means it needs to be a debit, 14,000. And the other side of it is gonna increase our defined benefit obligation. It's an actuarial loss. So they changed some assumptions in their calculations and they said, actually the present value of the defined benefit obligation is actually $14,000 higher than we thought. So of course that increases our liability here in this memo account and it's gonna decrease our equity, which is a debit. And we picked up everything in the question here. So now the last thing we need to do is just simply impact, uh, insert our totals. So I can do that pretty quickly in Excel. I'm just gonna sum these. Okay, and the question asked, the effect of the pension plan on pension expense and the company's shareholders equity. So pension expense, is 55,100 and shareholders equity is going to be impacted here by this 12,850 and this is a decrease to shareholders equity. So my answer for part one for us is going to be pension expense for 2020 is 55,150 and Shareholders' equity will decrease by twelve thousand eight hundred and fifty as a result of OCI impact impacts 
as well as as well as the fact that pension expense will close net income at the end of the year. We'll close to retained earnings, I should say. So ultimately, the impact the pension expense is fifty five thousand one hundred and fifty, which you can see here, and uh, the impact on uh, shareholders' equity is going to be this negative impact of twelve thousand eight hundred and fifty. So shareholders' equity will decrease, and this pension expense, the fifty five thousand, will close to retained earnings at the end of the year. So ultimately, this is all going to flow through retained earnings, sixty eight thousand or all flow through shareholders equity, I should say. Okay, so we completed part one. So that gives us this. Now it says part two. Now assume that the company follows ASPE instead of IFRS. Determine the 2020 effect of the pension plan on pension expense and the company's shareholders equity. All right, let's take a look at the entries we had here under IFRS. Now, if we were doing these same entries under ASPE, what would be different? Well, what would be different is that we wouldn't have this column here called OCI. OCI doesn't exist under ASPE. So we obviously need to do something with these amounts, these pre-measurement gains. So where does the actual return on plan assets go, the difference? And where do actuarial losses go under ASPE? Well, they both simply go to pension expense. There's no OCI under ASPE, so they can't go under OCI. So we need to put them into pension expense. They just go straight through the income statement. So if we do that, we can see this is what, how our worksheet would have looked under ASPE. So you can see our pension expense now is 68,000. There's no OCI, everything else is the same. So if we say part two, we can say pension expense, everything's terrible under ASPE is $68,000, which will ultimately decrease uh, retained earnings at the end of the year when we close out our expense through retained earnings to close out the year end, then that is gonna flow through retained earnings. So ultimately we'll of course decrease shareholders equity. And that takes us through the second part of the question. So just so it's clear, what we did under IFRS, we had OCI, which is where we had 12,850 there and 55,150 under shareholders equity. When we needed to change the worksheet to show ASPE, all we needed to do was get rid of the OCI column. There's no OCI under ASPE move whatever was in OCI through to go through pension expense. Given ASPE doesn't have OCI, the entries have to go through pension expense. There's no other option. So under ASPE, our pension expense was 68,000. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll continue to walk through some more accounting for defined benefit plans in the next tutorials.